Welcome to our talk on how Sivo uses K3S and cloud native storage to build our next generation Kubernetes platform. Hi, I'm Andy Jeffries. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Sivo. I've been a long time developer using languages such as Assembly, C++, Java, Pascal, PHP, and most recently Ruby on Rails and Golang. If you have any questions on this presentation or any questions about Sivo, feel free to reach out to me via Twitter. My handle is at the bottom left of the presentation. Sivo is an internet hosting company headquartered in Hertfordshire in the UK. We were set up in 2016 to try and build an infrastructure as a service product and then add value with developer friendly features. We transitioned over the years to becoming a Kubernetes provider, and we're currently a certified Kubernetes hosted solution. So first, a little bit of history on where we've come from as an infrastructure as a service provider. Like most people, we picked one of the major brands of hardware providers, in our case, Dell, and we built racks of them and run these on top of OpenStack. We started off with OpenStack Nataka, and we upgraded all through the versions to OpenStack Queens. So this is where we came from. Why have we changed? The first part was the API side of things. So OpenStack has an API service, but in reality, that's actually multiple services all looking similar, but not consistently the same. And we've had some problems with that. So there have been many times in the past where you would call an OpenStack API and find that it didn't actually complete the action you asked it to. Now, this may be because they use RabbitMQ as a central queue saw. So API requests make an entry on the queue system. Something else will pick it up and action them and eventually get back to another message on the queue system to report back to the API that it completed. The problem we had was that we would take action such as launch this instance, and then we would request the status from OpenStack to poll to see if it had completed, and OpenStack would be unaware of the instance suddenly. So that led us to having two separate databases, our own API database and the OpenStack databases. And we would spend a lot of time managing this split brain scenario where we had to keep our database and the OpenStack database in sync. So the next problem we had was how to upgrade our OpenStack. We had a working system running OpenStack Queens on Ubuntu 16.04. It was then time for Queens to be end of life as well as Ubuntu 16.04 reaching end of life. So we needed to upgrade both to OpenStack Rocky and to Ubuntu 18.04. We reached out to the OpenStack operators mailing list and their advice was, it's very simple. All you do is you buy an identical set of hardware, install OpenStack Rocky on it, and then transfer your workload from one to the other. Now, as a small provider, this is obviously cost prohibitive for us, as well as the fact that I don't think that advice was built around running a public cloud where migrating customer instances and their IPs from one set of hardware to another is a non-trivial operation. So we built the world's first managed K3S service, offering Kubernetes on top of our infrastructure as a service product. This was working great at the start, but unfortunately over time, OpenStack started to develop some bottlenecks. And along with this inconsistent launch ability, this led to our clusters going from a few minutes to launch up to five minutes and sometimes 10 minutes to get a completely working cluster. Now this was in line with the rest of the industry at the time. GK, Amazon, all were taking 10 plus minutes to launch clusters and that's fine. But our target market of developers, we wanted a more consistent and quick experience. We wanted clusters to be able to launch a cluster within two minutes. So we were trying to work around this with various tricks such as launching multiple instances and then destroying the instances that didn't launch in time. So if a customer requested that they wanted a five node cluster, we'd launch 15, the first five nodes be ready the customer gets, the other 10 we just delete silently behind the scenes. Obviously though, as we grow, this isn't sustainable. So we decided to build our own hardware stack. Here you can see the network diagram for what we've built. We have racks of servers, and we have top of rack switches, connected to spine switches, connected to the edge routers. Every layer is using at least 10 gigabit networks all the way out to the internet. Internally, obviously much faster. And there's no single point of failure. So any server has multiple routes to get all the way out to the internet as well as communicate internally. When it came time to choosing a hardware provider, we were considering going with the regular big box suppliers that everyone uses. But we learned more and more about the Open Compute project. This was set up by Facebook and a bunch of other hyperscalers 
And the idea is that they wanted to increase compute density and reduce the heat generated by having power supplies in every server. So, as you can see on the right, this is a picture of one of our actual production racks. Every 2U shelf has three servers on it. Each of these servers can be pulled out with just thumb screws, any component changed and slid back into the rack, completely toolless. It also allows us to get incredible performance and great density out of our racks. For our storage to be fast enough to be able to cope with modern workloads on cloud native systems, we decided to use NVMe drives throughout. So all of our instances and all of our K3S clusters are entirely backed by NVMe storage. When it came time to choosing an orchestration layer for our new platform, we decided to build it on top of Kubernetes. We were already offering Kubernetes to our customers and it actually fits the bill perfectly for what we're doing underneath the scenes as well. As one of the greats in our industry, Kelsey Hightower puts it, Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms, and this absolutely struck a chord with us. For virtual machines on top of Kubernetes, we use kubevert. This is a project that combines libvert, which is a great library for virtualization control, with Kubernetes custom resources and an operator. So you can create a Kubernetes resource for a virtual machine and know that the operator will take all of the steps cycling until it matches the state you wished. For the disks for the virtual machines, we partner with Storage OS. We tested out a number of different suppliers, had conversations with some of them, and in the end, Storage OS's team gave us the confidence that we could build a platform based on their technology. The guys there have been super helpful in determining where problems lie, how we can optimize things, and working with us to be able to develop our custom solutions. So they power all of the virtual machines and going forward, all of the persistent volumes that customers attach to their clusters. The software side of our Sevo stack is based around the concept of Kubernetes operators. Kubernetes operators work in such a way that you create a resource in the desired state in the etcd database using the Kubernetes API. Each operator is then asked to reconcile those changes and each time it will take a step of trying to make the actual world, the underlying resources, match the desired state in the Kubernetes database. Then a loop will be called again and then it will keep rotating round until the operator says, I've got no more changes, it matches the desired state. And it will then always make sure in, in the future that it matches the desired state, taking any corrective action it needs to. When we need to launch a new region or add a rack to our existing regions, our hardware vendor will supply us with a rack fully equipped and set up ready for use. All of the network cables connected correctly, just ready to plug in. We then ship this to our data center partners. The data center partner will then connect the power and networking and switch on the out of band equipment that we use. We then connect in to the out of band switch and we ask it to reboot every server in the rack via IPMI. These pixie boot into the base operating system that we use across our cluster. Once the reboot is completed and all nodes are running the base operating system, Sevo engineers will connect into the outer band switch and run a single Ansible playbook, which will install Kubernetes on all nodes and install our Sevo stack operator, which will take over installing the rest of our code. Once that Ansible playbook is finished, we end up with a completely working platform. All of our customer operators are running as well as storage OS and kubevert. So the advantages of Sevo stack for us is the Kubernetes operator pattern is easy to maintain for us. Each step is a simple step and then retry again and get it closer and closer to the desired state. We end up with no split brain. So the Kubernetes database is a single source of truth and we don't store local copies of every customer's details. Everything is in Kubernetes. And finally, bringing up new racks and new regions is almost zero touch. We have to run a single Ansible playbook once it's installed and everything just comes up for us. So now I'll use our command line interface to give you a quick demo of what Sevo can do. Okay, so here you see our terminal and we run the Sevo command line client, which lists all of the different resources that you can manage through the command line client. Today, we're going to be managing a Kubernetes cluster. So by running the command Sevo Kubernetes create with the dash dash help flag, we can see all of the options that the Kubernetes cluster creation will accept. The important one today is to use the applications flag to add an application from our ready-built marketplace. And we're going to use the wait flag to ensure that the cluster's finished creating before we try to use it. So here, if we copy this command, Kubernetes applications ls, 
we can see all of the available applications in our marketplace. For today, we'll use the Linkerd application. So the same command, Sivo Kubernetes create minus A for applications, specify the Linkerd application and the minus W to wait. Communicate with our API service and it's decided to create us the default three node cluster of medium instances with a randomly generated name. Now this part's been sped up so you don't have to wait the two minutes for the cluster creation during this video. Okay, so we go back to normal time. In a moment it will finish and it will say how long. So there's the name of the cluster, Weathered Wave, and it confirmed that it created it in just under two minutes. So let's show this cluster and see all the details we can see. We see the generated DNS name, the fact that it's running 1.20, number of nodes, and we can also show this in JSON format. If you're passing this into a script using JQ or something similar, or if you wish to use a custom output format, we can do that too. So we can specify minus O custom. And the minus F is the string we want to output, replacing any of the keys found in the JSON format with the correct values. Oops, mistyped Kubernetes. There's an alias for Kubernetes in the SIVO command line called K3s, and I sometimes use that. And there's our output ready to be put into a script. So the next thing we can do is download the config so that we can access the cluster using the normal kubectl command line client. We'll now put this into a temporary file called conf. And then we can specify the kube config variable at the command line and then use kube control to get the nodes in our cluster. There's our three nodes. And then finally, we can get all the pods. We can see there that link had completed about 78 seconds ago, and the cluster appears to have come up about 95 seconds ago. So link D ready to use in your cluster. And now we'll just clear it up as we finished our experiment, all in five minutes. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, reach out to us via Twitter.